you see that thing Battle Frankie posted after last week's episode? Which one? The a lot of people lot of post a lot of things. The on there. normalized human time when you like compare one clock cycle in a CPU at three gigahertz to like one second of real world time. Yeah, that thing was v- very eye opening. Let's say I I did not. Like I knew I understood this, I thought, but this illustrates it in the best way I've ever seen. Yeah, I, I knew all that stuff intuitively, but to see it quantified is uh, is a very different thing. Why don't you explain exactly what we're talking about? Yeah, here? It's hard to understand like what a nanosecond, how a nanosecond relates to, a, say, a microsecond. Right. So yeah. um, on a three gigahertz clock cycle, one clock cycle takes about three tenths of a nanosecond. So that's uh, three ten billionths of a second, I guess. And um, if you normalize that to one second, then accessing the level one cache of the the one that's built into the CPU takes three seconds. The level two cache takes nine seconds and the level three cache takes 43 seconds, which is bonkers. Like that's the big thing that we were talking about on the chiplet that holds the whole thing together. How accessing RAM, which takes between 70 and 100 nanoseconds, depending on the clock speed and latency of your RAM would would be equivalent to 3.5 to 5.5 minutes so it's like that was the that was the part where my eyes flew wide open like (laughs) the cache stuff makes sense it's like yeah okay sure the level three cache is going to take a a good number of clock cycles to because that's the slowest one of course but then once once we hit the ram one and i was like wait wait wait, system ram's supposed to be very fast right like that's the fastest thing outside of the cpu in the computer yeah but this normalized figure being like five minutes to access was yeah, so like the CPU wants something, it's in physical RAM on the motherboard, on you know, in the chips that you socket into your motherboard, and like it has to wait the equivalent of five minutes to get the answer back. That's yeah. bananas. That's it's wild. Well, keep going. It, it gets worse. Um, to access an NVMe SSD IO, which is usually about between seven and 150 microseconds, that's the equivalent of two hours to two days. That's a long time. Two, it's like two it's like getting a letter. <laughs> <laughs> um a, a rotational disk io oh you mean a hard drive a hard drive one to ten milliseconds of computer time is a, equivalent to 11 days to four months that's uh pony express man if that <laughs> maybe carrier pigeon i don't know we've we got to get this letter to chisholm by the next by by october don't worry the pony express has um internet latency comes into play next internet san francisco to new york city about a 40 millisecond ping which is i think uh, optimistic this is equivalent to about 1.2 years that's uh that's quite a while that's a, that's a yeah that's look uh, some people some people's whole life um the internet uh from san francisco to australia 183 milliseconds is six years yep. uh v- rebooting your virtualized os like if you have an, yes. if you have a os running in a in a vm hypervisor on your machine about four seconds on the pc 127 years compared that's, to the one nanosecond uh, uh the one cycle one second clock time that's longer than a lifetime uh rebooting the virtualization hypervisor i assume that's what that they're talking about here is 40 seconds that's 1200 years mm-hmm and mashing the reset <laughs> button on your computer and letting it come back up, which takes about 90 seconds, three millennia. So the processor has seen some shit. Yeah, this is some this is uh, some dark magic. I think that this was posted. Uh, I should have grabbed the link, but this was in an article that they had linked to uh, elsewhere from elsewhere. And I found it incredibly informative. A kind of a visualize. Disturbing? A little bit, a little bit unsettling to me. I like it's it's a little scary when you from, think about how much uh, this is from a site called formulasblack.com. dot uh, com. And if you Google compute performance distance of data as measure of latency, uh, it'll pop up for you. And we'll put a link in the show notes, too. But I, yeah, this is like we spent a long time talking about like how to visualize this kind of time scale at maximum PC. And this is easily the best and and should have been the most obvious solution for that. I don't think I would have trusted our math, frankly, because I would have gotten to the, oh, it takes 1.2 years to send a packet from New York to San Francisco and been like, no, nah, we probably didn't carry a zero right here somewhere. We should go back and plug this back into the spreadsheets. Yeah, but a site with formulas in the name, I think you can probably hmm. rest assured that their data is good. 
Uh, this I don't know. This is unsettling to me from both from the standpoint of putting into relief how much of our lives we are spending in front of computers. Yeah, and and also just thinking about a CPU's experience of time longer than you think will. It's it's funny longer than you think. There's there's um in Neil Stevenson's Seven Eves, which is one of my favorite books. Uh, he they talk about like there's a space based society, and they talk about processors and memory and things like that that you can't build in outer space because of cosmic radiation messing like like th there's a reason we still use like 80 cpus on a lot of um on a lot of uh space probes and it's because they're higher process you know very large processes by today's standards so that a stray particle smashing into the cpu as it's flying oh, through wow. space doesn't jack up the mash and and crash 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 the whole thing right literally literally need a bigger surface area on the chip to try to be be more resilient wider pathways for the electrons are safer is my understanding i'm sure that somebody in the discord will correct me when i'm wrong on that but um that's wild yeah it's a trip we do so, we do have people working in space technology there exactly um well, our last question all right this is going to be the longest cold open in history of this podcast oh we're not even close to that i i take it i take it you haven't read the jaunt i don't think you got my reference a minute ago no oh man what's okay. the jaunt i i can't i shouldn't tell you because i think you should read it it's a stephen king short story about Ooh. teleportation Ooh. That, you, that you should really read if you want to look at these numbers and feel um that sense of creeping dread <laughs> Welcome to Brad and Will Made a Tech Pod. I'm Will. Brad, hey, hello, hi. Hi, hi, hello, hi, hello. hi, 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 hi. What's happening? Uh, we're doing a podcast, Brad. Oh, crap. Oh, shit, I gotta go get my... Yeah, when Mr. Softy, the ice cream truck, came to town, I put on a pair mm. of dungarees last okay. Thursday. So. Fair. You don't want to show your knees to the ice cream guy. No. You gotta, you need a, you need a, some level of decorum when you go buy ice cream. It's, it's, it is like if you are going to order a ridiculous ice cream cone for an adult, like something rolled in sprinkles or dusted with Oreos ground up or something like that, you, you need to have a certain modicum of decency, I think. Gotta, gotta put on your business pants. Exactly. Um, so we've got an interesting topic today. Yes. Um, we were talking the other day about, early video cards and i had i guess i hadn't forgotten but i hadn't considered th there was once a time in the early days of 3d accelerators when there were at least seven or eight different vendors actively selling cards in that space yeah and i'm, I'm sad we didn't save this exercise for this episode we played it out on discord last night yeah but but uh we kind of i tried to run down like kind of walk down memory lane and remember what all those companies were and now i kind of know what they are but we should try to recreate it here just for the sake of yeah the audience yeah um also just a little bit of context for this episode i, I don't know about you but i think for me like i've just had this topic on the brain a lot because it's, this is the first time in i don't know four or five years at least that i felt like genuinely excited about new pc hardware mm -hmm. between it's, the yeah but between the 3080s and the the new amd the new ryzen's and stuff like pc hardware for the longest time for me has just been like ah, i guess i'll get a new cpu sure why not like it's cheap enough right now you know well, like there's like, not there's just not been a lot to be excited about there like the 1080 i feel like was that like that was a big leap forward like, you know, maybe the RTX cards were interesting, but not as fast as you wanted the, the 20 series. But like we're at, a, we're at a sweet spot right now where I'm like, I'm actually staring at hardware builds a lot right now again and like fantasizing. <laughs> so that, that takes me back to the mid 90s and those heady days of 8000 uh, 3D accelerators coming out all the time. Well, you'll see right now you'll see an actual real world performance improvement for like spending money on new hardware right in a way that right. you often don't which is exciting yes. uh so uh let's let, i guess let's let's start with like obviously everybody remembers 3dfx yeah um and then nvidia had the revo 128 early on uh ati rolled out the 3d rage well oh. 
Hang on, I'm gonna. I'm just gonna play act what I did last night. Okay. okay. So what I was able to come up, come up with off the top of the head. Yeah. Was the first one that came to mind was the rendition verite. The, I don't know why the original DirectX card. Yeah. Uh, the rendition verite. Obviously, the three effect, like the voodoo stuff, was like the thing as soon as it came out. Like nothing else mattered. Yeah. For a while there. Um, well, actually, that's not true. It wasn't until Quake came out that the voodoo stuff really mattered. Well, yeah, GeoQuake was the thing that, yeah. that made made 3D accelerators a thing, frankly. Because yeah. like um, I think you got Mech Warrior or something with your with your Voodoo card, Mech Warrior Two, and it was like right. a lightly texture mapped version of the yeah, software was, rendered Mech Warrior game. Not that 3D accelerated. Also, I think I bought that game at a Sam's Club, so I really lost out there. I bought um, it multiple times. I'm sure I came with every video card you bought for a while there. I, you know what? I would have I would have bought it just for that soundtrack multiple times. So it's that's, pretty good. That's totally it's fair. A uh, fine game. So for whatever reason, I came up with rendition and 3D effects, and then I stalled out and started thinking about like number nine and Matrox, which I don't think fit into this conversation that well. Well, so number nine never really released a 3D accelerator. They were wholly focused on 2D and video is my understanding. And they kind of disappeared. I think they got bought by somebody. I don't don't know. I don't actually know what happened to number nine. Um, I also don't think that their bit of selling graphics cards with... um, uh, with Beatles tie-ins, yeah, uh, would probably fly in today's world. Why but not? I, I mean, I, 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 I mean, I agree with you. It was a bit too twee for my taste, but I feel like the people at Apple Records would probably have something to say about that now, in maybe a way so. that they would not have been aware of back then. Sure. You're probably right. Like I'm, I'm sitting here looking at their Wikipedia page and some of their products for people that are not familiar with Number Nine Revolution. Yeah, Imagine Pepper. I feel like ticket, Revolution Ticket to Ride. Yeah, Ticket like, to Ride was where they went off the rails in terms of like a, naming a graphics card Ticket to Ride is like, yes, absolutely. That's that is a bridge too far. I mean, that said though, there's a board game called Ticket to Ride, right? Well, that's fine. I mean, that's yeah. probably got trains in it or something. It does I mean, have I, I'm fine with that. It, yeah. But that, that's not a video card, you know? Um, um so, so yeah, like I I mean, we'll probably touch on it some more, but I for whatever reason my mind went to Matrox and number nine, which are more like 2D graphics cards, which is like for people who were not doing PC stuff in the 90s, yes, you used to just have to buy a 2D graphics card. Yeah. Um, Went in the VL bus slot. Right. So you reminded me that ATI was active back then. For, for whatever reason, in my mind, ATI was not a player until the Radeon stuff, but obviously they were in it way before that. So, so yeah, they, they made 2D cards. Like, that's where they right. started 2D cards and video processing stuff. And they were... Um, uh, they were like a real... They were, they were like in the 2D graphics card realm there was like s3 kind of at the low end performant but not very good maybe not like didn't the image quality like here's the fun thing 2d graphics cards image quality mattered like some of them were better than others that's why i i mean we're kind of getting back onto 2d cards and off the topic of 3d accelerators here but like i lusted after a matrox millennium for so long and i think i think whatever like Whatever crappy no-name pre-built computer we had at home had a similarly crappy no-name 2D card in it. Yeah. And the desktop desktop literally did not look great. Like, I don't remember. I don't know how to qualify that because in my mind, like, I can't, I can't, I can't call to mind what the desktop looked like. But I think things were like maybe a little too fuzzy or like it was something about like the the VGA output was not clean enough or something like that. I forget. So part of it was that um, the the D the RAM DAC, the thing that converted the digital signal into an analog uh, signal that went out across VGA. If they were slow or bad, you'd get fuzzy signals on the VGA. Okay. Also, is about color reproduction and like window rendering speed and stuff like that. Like in Windows. 3.1 uh, with the right video card you could preview the window while you drug it around oh, and sure. if you didn't have the right video card it would just be like an outline a box the, the, outline yeah, of yeah. an empty window yeah the little dotted line outline and then you could watch it literally draw back in from the top <laughs> wow. to the bottom okay if you had a slow not, video card our card was not that bad thankfully but no. uh well, but I, I remember I remember wanting a Millennium just because, yeah, it accelerated Windows stuff more and it had very nice, like clean, 32, clean signal. 32 bit, baby. Yeah. Um, well, so the thing the thing that happened around the time 3D accelerators started taking off was that the what had previously been low and mid range 2D parts became pretty good, like good enough. Right. So S3 ATI. Um, Revolution was always on the high end, uh, or sorry, uh, number nine was always on the high end, um, stuff like that. But so, so Matrox and ATI, both uh, fine Canadian companies. Yes. Um, the Rage 2 was kind of, 
I, I think it was billed as a 3D accelerator and you could get get it with a copy of uh, Mech Warrior 2. But it was like kind of lightly texture mapped. <laughs> but they're not really was the was the, was the thing I recall on that one. Was that was that their first major card, the Rage 2 in, in the 3D space? And and was that an all in one card or was that an add on? So it was an all in all of these were all in one cards, except for the really? except for the um, the 3D FX stuff. They were okay. uh, interesting. Oh, Power VR. Power VR was 3D only, too. Yeah, so we haven't uh, just to fully before we move on, just to finish our little rundown of the yeah, roster yeah. here. Um, S3, I guess, was huge, but I had completely in my mind like glossed over the fact that they even existed. At S3 time. was a big deal. Like S3, it took me a minute. It took me a minute, but I, I the, the name S3 Verge finally floated back into my into my consciousness. Uh huh. V I R G E. Uh, right. I couldn't, but I couldn't remember if it was E R or I R. So That's they how much sold- I'd forgotten it, but buttloads of 2d cards into like compact and packard bell and like all the they, they sold a lot to oems the big okay. oems okay and um they also would kind of run so one of the one of the de- the defining gate for me on 3d accelerators in like 1996 97 98 was would it run quake yes. like in the in the days before direct x before direct 3d and um, more well, like the second wave of 3D accelerated games that started in like 97. Like it was if it didn't run GL Quake, it didn't count as a 3D accelerator, even if it totally. did like a little bit of bit mip mapping and stuff like that on some textures. Um, and the Rage 2 wouldn't run Quake. The Matrox Millennium wouldn't run Quake. The S3 well, Millennium, cards wouldn't Millennium run Quake. Just a 2D card, right? Well, yeah, but I mean, th- yeah, it wasn't until the Mystique that that Matrox had a card that would run Quake. Kind they of tried. <laughs> Um, the, uh, so the ATI's first Quake card was the Rage Pro, which was also one of the first AGP cards, which we'll get to in a minute. Yeah. Um, okay. So S3, I don't think S3 ever in the time period that mattered made a compelling 3D, 3D card. Would you categorize them as an also ran in I, this space? Well, so one of the things that's interesting about any, oh, oh well, hold on. We have a couple more. Intel was making yeah, so, 3D accelerators. So, so Intel, when you threw that out there, I was like, wait, what? I don't yeah remember that in the slightest so they made um they partnered with lockheed and a company called chips and technologies that intel ended up buying a little bit later um and released the i740 which was a another early agp card um and it was if you recall ram was really expensive and hard to get then during that time period vaguely <clears throat> so like there'd been there'd been some sort of disaster an earthquake or a fire or something that cratered uh, RAM production 93 or 94 and it took a long time to come back online because it was a different time back then so so a lot of the AGP design was was set up so that you could run video stuff out of system memory rather than having to have you know eight eight megabytes of RAM in the system and another four megabytes of RAM on the video card which which was an astronomical amount of RAM it's shocking it was well, shocking. At that point, hundreds I, of dollars I, I might have had 16 megabytes in my PC at that point. Oh, really? I uh, think I probably had eight and was pretty happy. Anyway. I mean, maybe it was eight. I forget. But uh, I mean, that's back when RAM was like $50 a megabyte. More than that. I paid at one point I paid 150 bucks per megabyte for a two megabyte <sighs> upgrade. Wow. That's yeah. that is physically painful to hear. Yeah, that, so was, right, that was in like 93, I, I, though. OK. Yeah. So I just glanced at the the Intel, the, the i740 yeah. page, the Wikipedia page, and that came out in 98. So we're kind of. We're kind of swinging back and forth across a like two, three year time span back back in front here a little bit. So, yeah, it was it was it's a weird time because like during the launch of the first version of like the Revo 128 launched at a time when like probably the only 3D accelerated things were Quake and Unreal and maybe um, like Terminal. Re- there were some probably some 3D Realms game like Terminal Reality or something that was 3D accelerated at that point. Sure. That sounds right. But it was like mostly Very limited yeah it was it was and there were some flight sims i feel like falcon wasn't falcon 6.0 3d accelerated for the first time maybe oh was it was it that far along or i thought they were on like 3.0 3.0 yeah it was only the big binder yeah 3.0 came out in 91 I, did they ever even get past 4.0 i thought that was the last falcon maybe yeah maybe i'm maybe i'm uh, i'm 4, conflating 4. Two different things 4.0 4. was 98 so that was probably 3d accelerated yeah. at that point so well, just to kind of start back at the start before we get too much into the AGP in the late 90s yeah, stuff, yeah, yeah. like obviously like 3D effects, like a friend of mine got a voodoo card 
you know, not long after GL Quake came out and like I went over to his house and saw it and fell out of my chair, <laughs> you know, like the defining moment in my history with both technology and video games. But like you could, did you have much contact with that stuff before the voodoo came along? Like I'm trying to get a sense of what there, what was in the market before the voodoo, but when that kind of, you know, that, obviously that revolutionized everything, but like, well, so like, like I bought a rage two card when I built a PC the first time. Okay. Um, or, uh, and put that in, it may have been even before that it may have been in my, in, in, uh, the Pentium 60 that I bought when I went to UT, uh, and, like I was kind of unimpressed with it, like 3D, 3D accelerators until the voodoo card seemed like kind of like it seemed like a cool thing for SGI to do. And it seemed like something that wasn't real for people at home. So like, sure. like if you played like the rendition V Quake port that they made. So so the other thing that's important to note is that up until Quake, most games only supported external like a proprietary vendor specific APIs. So right. like Glide, Glide for 3 like the, the famous example. Exactly. Right? Um, Verite, uh, Rendition wrote V-Quake, which was for their Verite would be right. V1000. Oh, V-Quake. Um, and I think Carmack helped with that, obviously. Uh, so I'm <laughs> not to derail, but I'm sitting here. There is, of course, there is a GitHub repo that has oh, every, right. every, every plan file update he ever wrote. <laughs> so I'm just sitting here control effing it. Um, and it's funny, like, so Quake came out in mid-96, and I'm sitting here looking at an entry for December 13th, 96, mm. where he says, for the record, here is my impression of the 3D hardware I have worked with, blah, blah, blah. I, this uh, was a defining moment for me, this, this plan file. So basically, the two consumer cards on this list are the Rendition Verite at $150 and the 3DFX Voodoo at $300. Yep. And then, like, eight or ten workstation cards that no mortal could ever have contact the with 3d the, labs one the sgi the, the, eric stuff the the intergraph intense 3d the yeah. sgi 02 the sgi impact mm -hmm. the let's see just to be clear uh, the sgi 02 was like a fifty thousand dollar computer as i recall yes that literally this is this sgi impact entry he said here a full system was literally 25 to fifty thousand dollars yeah and sgi infinite reality was over a hundred thousand dollars yeah and those <laughs> those machines those boxes for those things were huge like they were yeah. like mini computer type spaces, his, not, his, not PCs. His his quick his quick write up of the SGI Infinite Reality, which is the hundred thousand dollar workstation fill rate from hell, polygons from hell. If you don't trip up on state changes, nothing will come within shouting distance of the system. You would expect that. Yeah. For the reason I bring reason I bring this up is that like like I said, outside of the the, the Verite and the Voodoo, like everything else on here is extremely high-end workstation hardware. There just wasn't that much out there. I, was, sorry, there was one other card on here, the 3D Labs Per Media for $300? That was a workstation card. Yeah, um, that's, okay, yes. That, a a well-supported, low-end OpenGL card. So I guess, yeah, that would be for workstation stuff. So it was a thing, if I recall correctly, it had a, it was the least expensive way to get a fully-fledged OpenGL stack because the, the OpenGL driver for the 3 3d fx cards was just a wrapper so it wrapped mm -hmm. the OpenGL calls to glide calls okay um and it wasn't like it wasn't a full implementation and because that card was a standalone 3d accelerator and couldn't do stuff in windows a lot of OpenGL stuff like you couldn't run your OpenGL cad programs on that right um also so, probably so didn't have a memory and so that's why you were having to get a bespoke version of Quake for every card, right? Exactly. Quake, GL Quake, because they were all being written directly to what those cards could do. Well, so GL uh, Quake was written for OpenGL. Oh, right, right. Um, yes, it would run on any GL hardware, yeah, v, right? Yeah, VQuake. So Carmack did VQuake with the rendition people, I think. And then after that, he was like, I'm not building a bunch of proprietary Quakes. There's no other. We're going to do this in OpenGL. And and like that, that immediately made OpenGL a gaming API when it had previously been for um, the, the like workstations and CAD and stuff like that. Previously had been for doing your effects in Terminator 2 and Jurassic Park. Pretty much, yeah. And stuff like that. It was a weird, um, it, it was a weird time. Like It was a really weird, interesting time with all this stuff being very emergent and not well-defined. Like, I not to, we won't harp on his plan files for this whole episode, but if you scroll down two, two more entries past the one I was just reading from, you get to what I consider probably the seminal plan update. Okay. Which is December 23rd, 1996, entitled OpenGL versus Direct3D. <laughs> oh, and this was when they were talking about, this was before Direct3D was even out, right? Right. I, or, uh, what, 96, you said? Yeah, this was December 96. So that's like six-ish months after Quake came out. Oh, so that's after, that's when Direct3D 3.0 
DirectX 3.0 had launched in September of that year. And we were like DirectX 1 and 2 were kind of uh, like not worth speaking of. Right. And like this is uh, this is full on like soapbox mode. He's just here kind of opining about how these things work and Mm -hmm. how much he likes or hates them. And there's like straight up there's straight up code snippets in this thing of like showing how vertex operations work in in each one and stuff like this. But um, it was just such a it was such an early time and the stuff was so ill defined and like all over the place, you know. Well, I mean, the big argument was that the DirectX APIs kind of limited what you could do. Like, well, it didn't give you direct control over the hardware in a way that was it abstracted things out a little bit further than people like Carmack wanted. Um, I think in the art in, in the with the idea that it would be easier for normal human programmers that weren't John Carmack or Tim Sweeney or you know Charlie Brown or whoever to to build off of, right? Um, well, but also it became necessary in a world with like eight hundred different cards on the market, right? Like yeah. at some point you can't you can't be writing directly to the hardware of every model of card out there. Well, so then it shifted the burden from the from the developers to write for the individual hardware to the driver vendors to like not jack up the drivers. <laughs> ah, yes. Which led to our current state of 500 megabyte graphics driver downloads every two weeks. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that makes sense. But um, was there a lot of like FUD around Microsoft? Oh. I, I feel like I vaguely remember like Jesus. Just, I mean, this was was there. This FUD? was <laughs> this was squarely in the middle of the like people writing Microsoft with a dollar sign in it era of well, people the, not trusting Microsoft. This is when they were being, this is when the antitrust suit was in the, in the begin, barest beginnings, right? I this, guess, I, I guess so. Yeah. This is when they were doing the stuff that got them sued by the federal that's, government for that's, that's fair. Yeah. Um, it was race extend extinguish. Like, yeah, I feel like, <laughs> I feel like a lot of the, the concern about the, the concern about Microsoft owning the APIs that drove 3d was the same thing that we hear people talking about with Facebook and VR right now, where, you know, you you didn't want this monolithic company to own the thing that the future, you know, the APIs that the future was built on. Um, it ended up like the thing that ended up happening is as the as the hardware vendors coalesced into from eight or nine vendors into two vendors or maybe three if you count Intel, um, the it ended up being the hardware vendors driving those APIs as much as Microsoft. So it, it like it ended up working out. If we had only ended up with one, if if we only ended up with either Intel or AMD, ATI, and Intel, I think we'd be in a much different situation, and we wouldn't be seeing the kind of performance that we are on graphics today. So it was lucky that at least have, two companies survived because they pushed it forward so much. They, I mean, they push each other. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The competition's good. It turns out. Yeah. Uh, before we move on too much from the beginnings here, I happen to have the rendition Wikipedia page in front of me, and oh. I just have to mention the naming on some of this stuff. Yeah, they had a they had an API for DOS called Speedy 3D. That sounds great. How fast was Which, it? Was I don't it speedy? know. I just like I just can't help thinking about like Speedy Gonzalez here. Uh, <laughs> scrolling <laughs> scrolling down some of the products that were released, Sierra. Wait, who? That can't be. That's not the game maker Sierra. That's got to be really. I think that's somebody. Else. I think that's uh, oh, what became I, Sierra's links, logic. Maybe. Oh, it, no, it totally links to the Sierra Online Wikipedia page. Apparently, Sierra put out a rendition card called the Screamin' 3D. Oh, I, yeah, we had one of those in the lab at Maximum PC. Oh, really? It was the box was on the wall. I I totally am sitting here googling the box art for Screamin' 3D right now. I need to see that. Oh, the box art, the box art for these was all bad. If you think if you think video card boxes are ridiculous now, go back to the mid '90s. Oh yeah. Uh, but uh, anyway, so yeah, like I, I don't know where to go with this. I mean, rendition was out there. I in my mind, like some months before the Voodoo came along. The quake was a thing. That's correct. Yeah. And then the voodoo came along and like changed everything, of course. But um, to touch on something you mentioned earlier, I did not realize that it was the I didn't realize the voodoo was the exception to the rule about being an all in one integrated card. Like because the, the voodoo was an add in card and you had to run a literal analog pass through cable. You, you plugged your, your video. You had a little short VGA cable that plugged from your main video card into the voodoo card. Yeah, and then you your plugged, desktop card. Yeah. And then you plugged the monitor into the voodoo card and, and then it would forever, literally do a state switch. Like the voodoo yeah. card would detect that you'd launch something that used glide and it would turn off 
the yeah. pass through and just render itself. You you would you would at least with the card I had, which I believe was the Orchid Righteous 3D. Oh one yeah, I had. that's a that was a, uh, that was one of the two. Was that or the Diamond Monster 3D? It was not. It was not the Diamond Monster, which was the gold standard to most people. But I think uh, they were both exactly the same were, cards. Just all, to be clear, they were all practically the same. Except I you know, now seems like the time to touch on my teenage lust for the Canopus Pure 3D. Now that was a card. Which was just a voodoo card, except it had two extra megabytes of memory. <laughs> I think it had six megabytes of memory on it. Well, so Canopus did some other weird stuff, too, because they had an integrated card that was um, like a, a 2D card with a daughter card on it that was the 3D FX card. So it was all in one thing. And it also Canopus uh, did internal pass throughs if you had a Canopus 2D card and a Canopus 3D card. Maybe that's what I was interested in. Uh, they were, can, well, so, that was a Jap- I believe they, that was a Japanese company. So, yeah, they made arcade boards was the other I thing thought, that they oh, did. Oh, interesting. Did, they did those Obsidian, uh, The I, I want to say, what was that? What was that jet, the jet ski race game, the arcade game? Um, uh, <sighs> jet ski. Um, anyway just pretend we remember yeah they made um people are screaming at their radios right now but they made a bunch of um they they made the 3d like for a lot of those early arcade cabinets that were that were driven by 3d effects hardware they made those boards and put okay. enough ram on them that they could run at like arcade resolutions sure um, and they would also jam multiple texturing units on which which is like that's the that's the interesting thing about the so first off, all of these cards are passively cooled. At most, yes. they had a heat sink, which was yes. sometimes viewed as a negative in the in the press at the time. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, I'm sitting here. I'm sitting here looking at the Canopus Wikipedia page, which is very short. It's like three paragraphs, but it says when the Voodoo Two was released, the Canopus Pure 3D Two was praised for the fact that their cards were shorter than the competitors' Voodoo Two cards. Yeah, yeah, it fit in more uh, case. Yeah. Well, like yeah. so, I had an AST Pentium 60 at that point. I think. And that card was a pizza box case. And like, okay, there were a small number. Like if you had a giant long chonker of a video card, it just wouldn't go in there. Right. Um, but yeah, God was it like, was the mentality basically that if you need a heat sink on your card, you have screwed up on the design end. Probably somehow. pretty much. Yeah. Like my Pentium 60 didn't have a heat sink. It was just yeah, a my, bare my, chip. Yeah, my, my Pentium 75 did not either. And that machine became quite unstable over time. Shocking that. Uh, Who knew? Granted, I, to be fair, I had overclocked it to 75. So that probably... <sighs> Or no, 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 I'm sorry. It was a 75 to 90. Yeah, that was what I had a 75 and it was not stable at 100, but I could overclock it to 90 and then it became borderline unusable after about a year and a half. Yeah. Uh Weird. Um, Weird that. uh, Yeah, I was going to mention with the um, with the pass through on the voodoo cards like you would hear. I I don't know if it was just the one I had or maybe they all did this, but you would hear like you would hear that good solid like metallic thunk sound every time it switched over to the 3D card. Yeah, remember that? Was like that, I think that was in the monitor, though, wasn't it? Because it was a refresh was change, probably. Maybe, maybe it was the monitor. It was like it's a squared. chunk. Yeah, it wasn't. There wasn't like a physical switch in the cards, though. No, 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 no. Yeah, there was no solenoid popping or anything you think, like you that. You think it was more of a kachunk than a thunk? Um, so they did. Uh, 3DFX did the. They, there's a. There's a lot. Like, it was a weird time because it also. Like, so what a 3D these things weren't called GPUs because there wasn't a lot of processing. Basically they were just like texture mapping engines on a card. I think, I think 3d accelerator was the accepted term back then, right? That's what we called them. Yeah. And, and they would, um, basically what, what the CPU would do all the triangle setup and all that stuff. And it would establish a mesh and then the video cards would handle Z buffering. So they'd see what, what was visible in that scene and then they'd apply textures to it. And like, there were a wide variety of, of approaches to that power VR did this tile based thing where they did where they didn't do visibility checks, uh, um, on the whole scene at once they would just do the little chunks and then that would save them a buttload of memory bandwidth basically because they were only pulling textures for things that they would actually map um I, as i recall that was also one of the ones that had problems in their OpenGL stack where there were giant cracks in the world where the tiles didn't line up right or something i don't i don't know them i don't know exactly what was happening there but i remember in that in that experience, in that instance, it was bad. The other thing that was weird about Power VR was it was a standalone 3D accelerator, but it it you could do 3D in a window on that uh, because it 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 passed over to the 2D cards frame buffer. Oh, interesting. Across PCI. 
Right. I don't know if we mentioned it. That was another limitation of the Voodoo was that it could not do windowed 3D, only full screen. No windowed 3D um, on the Voodoo 1 or Voodoo 2, only on the Rush and the Banshee and the yeah, 3 the other, eventually. Right, right. Those were their integrated cards. The other downside that I didn't mention of, and then maybe this was also model specific, but it made my 2D desktop look like shit. It made everything fuzzy. Yeah. Which made me want to die because that was right after I got a Matrox Millennium. <laughs> I finally, I finally got the good 2D desktop card that made everything nice and sharp and smooth. Oh, and then no. I, and then I got a Voodoo and it made it look like shit again. Well, so, so the other thing about all these cards is that they were really low resolution. Like, like at a time when a normal desktop was probably 800 by 600. Yeah, I don't think you could run a Voodoo One card above 640 by 480. No, no definitely not at any perform it maybe not at all it, but it definitely not memory at yeah level of performance yeah sure yeah and um, and um like like the thing that the thing that was amazing about those early cards is you went from like these kind of not grainy exactly but it just felt it felt it was real grungy software rendering in quake while a technical marvel was was kind of scuzzy feeling yeah um and then when, when you loaded up something that could do mip mapping on the textures, which is basically where it looks at has different different resolutions of the texture and the video card knows to drop the right one in at the right distances. You got these unbelievably clear textures. You're like, wait, is this what this game is supposed to look like? And I played it all the way through not looking looking like this. This is this is kind of magic. And then, you know, games like and and, and still like if you're looking at a texture that was that would have had multiple mipmap levels across. Like if you're looking at, if you're looking down the length of a wall, right, you would get one of the mipmap levels in the wall because we didn't have a nice tropic filtering or trilinear filtering or anything like that on the cards at that point. So it wasn't able to sample different mip levels based on where the, like for the different distances of that same texture that you were looking at. Um, but it was, it was still kind of incredible. And then when they, when the Voodoo 2 came out, all of a sudden you had multi-texturing that could happen in one pass. So like each frame could have multiple, two textures applied to each surface. So you'd have like, like a, a lighting texture and a, and a, and a, and a picture texture, right? Okay. I'm trying to think of some other like real world use cases for that. I mean, is that when you were able to start applying like decals to walls, like bullet holes and blood and stuff like that? Or that was probably later because I feel like the Voodoo 2 actually had like there were three chips on the texture on this on the chip. There was one that was the main the FX chip and then there were two TX chips that each was responsible for one text texture pass per cycle per frame. Uh, so so you you could do that before, but it would take multiple multiple passes on each frame to do it or to do a multi-texturing pass is my understanding but i could be wrong i don't i don't know this was this was from a time before when people talked about this stuff like you know now nvidia and ati when they release new gpus they dump they they sit down with all the tech press and they're like okay here's exactly how this stuff works here's how deep the pipelines go here's how much cash each part has here's what the what the what the programmable parts of the pipeline are capable of and back then they just released the cards and there was a like one page spec sheet that they handed out to people at comdex when they wanted to buy when when you know, when they came in and like compact rolled in and they're like well here's here's what our new video card can do it's like it costs this much it's uh you know it's going to get uh this many blit marks and uh it'll run quake and people are like okay in we're putting that in every compact that we're shipping this year good enough yeah um, ship it it was it was a weird it was a weird time for yeah. sure was the was the was the voodoo 2 another pass through card that was still not a voodoo 2 was a pass through card still not another a full desktop card but right also the voodoo 2 had an internal sli port so you could put two of them in oh which god basically, is that when sli started that's when sli started and it would let you play it i think 1280 1024 by 768 if you had two of them in sli um and uh, the funny thing is, because of the way that card worked, it is maybe the last time that adding a second video card to your system gave you a one to one increase in performance for each. Like you get double the performance for each, assuming assuming again, because all of the triangle setup and all of that stuff was done on the CPU, assuming your CPUs had fast enough floating point to do that. So they, they set very poor expectations for SLI early on that it never lived up to again. <laughs> well, but it also... Like when I upgraded from a Voodoo 1 to a Voodoo 2, I was on a K6, like 166 or 200 or something that had bad floating point, but good integer math. And it turned out that I saw no performance increase going from the Voodoo 1 to the Voodoo 2 because the CPU couldn't keep up with the card huh. at all. Well, wow. Everything was CPU bound then. 
Uh, so, so I hmm, like I, there's a couple stories here. I mean, there's there's the thing where 80 percent of these companies just fell away and either got acquired or went out of business or whatever. Well, that happens um, when there's a big a big shift in the way like it, it happened with phones, too. Right. Like when sure. when the iPhone came out and Android rolled out. Nokia and and uh, Motorola and all those companies that had been making dumb phones for for 10, 15, 20 years, uh, a lot of them didn't survive that transition. I mean, I guess it's the natural evolution of a new market being created, essentially, right? Because yeah. that's what happened with phones. And that's what happened here. Of You know, there, there was no market for 3D accelerators. And then there was. And so everybody tried to get in. And then only a couple of them made it out. Well, and, and even the ones that did make it out, like... 3D effects got bought by NVIDIA in like in the early 2000s, right? So that's that's like the, I, there are two stories here. There's there's the story of when I got a TNT and like everything changed. Yeah, like, yeah. That was that like the Voodoo was like an amazing proof of concept, but the TNT was the first. That's the NVIDIA card for people who don't know. Well, um, so like those are the, the kind of twin narratives here are. I got my first NVIDIA card and granted, it sounds like the first couple of NVIDIA cards were not amazing, but the TNT was kind of mind blowing at the time. Um, so there's like kind of the rise of NVIDIA and the all-in-one card that was actually very good. And then there is the like meteoric rise and fall of 3D effects. Like 3D effects went from the name in 3D graphics to not even a going concern in the space of like what, four years, five years, I think. Yeah. Like so, they got, I think they got acquired by NVIDIA in 2000 ish. It was right when I started at maximum PC, as I recall, because uh, and they sent us a voodoo five, 6,000, Right. A, a, like a proto board with like wires dangling off of it that, that where was, it was, was an engineering right, sample. Like, like the Voodoo, did the Voodoo 5 even make it to market? Never or made it. Maybe, the, maybe the low end version did, but the big, the four, the four processor one didn't never made it to market. Right. So like f- for them to go from the, the card to get in the Voodoo and Voodoo 2 era to like, I, I assume they basically sold at fire sale prices to, to NVIDIA. I, I, I mean, I think they bought IP and, and engineers right. and that was it. Right. Um, right. the, so the thing, the thing that's the, the TNT is a, is an interesting card because like TNT and rage pro, like both of those are really important. Rage pro was in a lot of gateway machines, as I recall, and Dell machines. So like if you were buying computers for, <laughs> excuse Bless me, uh, say a computer lab in 2000, in 98, 99, all of a sudden, like a commodity computer could run quake, Right. So yeah. it wasn't like you needed some weird add in video card that made your 2D desktop look like crap and uh, and and was going to have all sorts of weird requirements. It just worked. And that was GL Quake. That was GL about? Quake. Yeah. Um, the, the TNT was the higher end version of that. The TNT was a really compelling part at at uh, like when when the Reva 128 launched, the, there was a thing I sent you last night was there was a big interview in boot in like 96, I guess, or 97 maybe even 98, where David Kirk, who was the chief scientist at NVIDIA for a long time, was basically doing the apology tour for <laughs> Reva 128 driver problems and and overall shortcomings in that part. And then they rolled out the TNT, which he had hinted at in that in that interview. And it was it, a the drivers were really solid, which it was a lesson NVIDIA learned early that like without without good drivers, it didn't matter how fast the hardware was. Um, and two. Uh, it was, it really ripped. Like it was fast. You could run Quake in a window. You could play GL Quake, everything, you know, it, and it, and it was performant and you could play at high resolutions. Even that was, that was my Quake 2 card is, is my memory of the TNT. I yeah. got a TNT maybe sometime after Quake 2 came out and it was a, also, it was an all in one card. So it was nice to just have one card that did desktop and really nice 3d graphics, but, but also, yeah, it was fast as hell. And in, in my memory, so it's uh, funny for a long time I had a TNT card and a voodoo card in my computer at the same time um just because it was still like Quake 1 still worked better on the voodoo card than it did on the TNT card because of driver implementation weirdness. Okay. Sure. And I was still playing competitive Quake 1 on the LPB leagues at that point. <laughs> sure. Uh, or the HPB leagues, sorry, the the hyping hyping people leagues you're, you're talking you're talking to somebody who got i got a 3dfx card and started playing quake on that because my pentium 75 couldn't run it for shit yeah in software but but then i got a pentium 200 later 
Yeah. And I was getting such a high frame rate in software quake on that thing that I went back to software quake because I would rather have the frame rate. You were probably one of those people uh, that would have played net quake instead of GL uh, instead of quake uh, world. I'm not gonna, quite going to go that far. It's, but uh, we talked about those Carmack plan updates, but I remember like you'd see a new plan update from Carmack and you're like, is this going to be about quake world? Is it gonna be about GL quake? Either one was fine. Yeah, like I was reading about the Quake World announcement. Mm -hmm. I was reading that post last night. Yeah, when when he basically like almost hat in hand came in front of the Quake community and was just like, without in so many words, was just kind of like, "Look, we get it. The internet performance for NetQuake is unacceptable. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to fork the code base and start over and deliver a new online client for people." Also, there's an amazing line in there. Uh, Gosh, I don't know if I can find it off the top of the head right now. The, the first time I played G uh, Quake World was at my dad's office because it came out while I was home on Christmas break. And I, I drove literally got in the car and drove to the office and downloaded it and uh, put it on his work computer and played software Quake World on his modem there because we didn't have a computer at the house at mom and dad's house at that point. And I was just like, oh, God, I can play this on the modem. This is yeah, it was a whole new actually world. actually playable. Yeah. It felt like a real video game. This is the line from that uh, from the plan file where he basically reveals the existence of Quake World, where he describes it as a pet research project. If it looks feasible, I would like to see Internet focused gaming become a justifiable biz direction <laughs> for us. It's definitely cool, but it is uncertain if people can actually make money at it. So so I'm sure when he says it's he's uncertain, people can actually make money at it. They were looking at like those pay to play modem dial in services yeah. like Dwango. Sure. Um, where you pay like five bucks a month and you could dial into a local thing and play Doom against other people in your yeah. in your town. Yes. Um, Obviously, there were early attempts at monetizing that kind of stuff, but it just just in light of history and where things have gone, seeing somebody say, yeah. I don't know if you can make money at online gaming, but we're going to mess with it. Uh, maybe I don't know, man, maybe it's kind of amusing. Uh, um, but but yeah, so we were talking about consolidation. Like if we go down this list of the eight companies, so we have 3DFX, Power VR, NVIDIA, ATI, Matrox, S3, Intel, and Rendition. Rendition's yeah. gone. I don't Did know. What just, I actually don't know what happened to them. Let me see. I'm sure they got here. bought by somebody, but uh, 3DFX got bought by NVIDIA in the early 2000s and for mostly for patents and, and engineers, is my understanding. Uh, Micron, Micron purchased Rendition. Micron, the memory man manufacturer? That's, that's what this says. Yeah. Wow. Interesting. Uh, as a uh, as a source of embedded graphics solutions for their own line of motherboards. Mm. There you go. So, uh, Power VR ended up focusing on mobile, and they are one of the main SoC G, uh, GPU vendors for um, ARM processors. To this day, right? To like this that day, name that name still exists. Yeah, with a, with a little detour into the Dreamcast. Uh, that's true. Yeah, they did the V two version of the Tile VR architecture was the thing that made the Dreamcast work. There was like, look, there was a lot of scene drama around the Dreamcast because every, <laughs> everybody thought they were going. Sega had everybody thinking they were going in the Dreamcast. Like 3DFX sued them for $155 million. What? Yeah. Um, because they had given proprietary hardware information because they thought 3DFX was going to power the Dreamcast. Ooh. Um, 3DFX did a lot of arcade boards for Sega, is my understanding, in that time I think, period. Yeah. I think that's right, yeah. Uh, I feel like... Somebody else uh, also thought they were going in the Dreamcast. And then it turned out going in the Dreamcast wouldn't have helped anyone, really, probably. <laughs> no, not so much. That console lasted, what, about a year and a half? If that, yeah. Roughly. Um, the uh, Okay, so Power VR. NVIDIA obviously is NVIDIA, and they're powering the future. Uh, yeah. ATI got bought by AMD in 2006. Mm -hmm. uh, they spun out. They had bought uh, BitBoy's Oi, which was one of those hushed tones on message boards and used oh my god companies dude, the, the, the 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 game that bit boys was talking about their forthcoming product that never materialized well, was they insane came, they came out of um the demo scene like swedish demo yeah, scene yes yes they were from scandinavia right yeah. so they were they were a bunch of like 64k coders and stuff like that and i'm trying to remember what claims they were making well, i just so th that part doesn't were, matter they were quoting well they were quoting numbers and performance metrics that sounded completely impossible they, they were talking about like like next gen it was the equivalent of them talking about ray tracing in like 2005 right 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 um, and, and and the fact that they never actually shipped a product well, so they got bought by they got bought by ATI right before yeah. AMD bought ATI and then okay. when they were when AMD bought ATI for a 5 billion dollars or whatever it was, was an enormous amount of money then they spun bitboys back out to Qualcomm 
who oh. then developed the thing that they were talking about into the Adreno processor, which also is in a lot of like that's Qualcomm's GPU SOC component. Okay. So the BitBoys people actually shipped a product. Uh huh. And hey, look at those letters in Adreno, Brad. Oh. Yeah. Is it an anagram? Uh, maybe. Maybe. For a popular ATI graphics processor. Oh, hey, look at that. Yeah. Who would have thought? Yeah. So, um, I think everybody feels good about that. Artex was another one of those companies that was like in the in the 30 companies that were developing 3D accelerator <laughs> technologies in like the late 90s yeah. that ended up getting bought by ATI. That's what ended up in the Dolphin, the I guess, which is became, yeah, became the GameCube. Yeah. Which reminded me that GameCubes straight up have an ATI sticker on them, don't they? Hell yeah. Yeah. Right on the front. If, purple if spot. I, if, if I remember, just like the Dreamcast had a Windows CE logo on there somewhere. Yep. Yep. I mean, um, uh, let's see. Matrox still makes uh, graphics uh, video processing stuff and yeah, like I was video shocked. wall installations and stuff like that. I, uh, I would I was sure that Matrox would have been one of those casualties of this era. But yeah, they're they're still out there. They, they yeah, like they make a lot of embedded solutions for mm-hmm. like if you got some giant video wall you need to power. Well, so Matrox always they came around in like the early two thousands to maximum PC. They were the first ones who were like, hey, we think this multi monitor thing is going to be a big deal. Huh. Um, and. Who thought? here's a solution that will let you play your video game across three monitors stretched around. And of course they were like CRTs with big fat bezels and stuff like that. So it was kind yeah. of goofy at the time. It was too expensive and too, uh, too bulky. Well, and to be the feasible cards back couldn't then. drive it really. Cause it's 20 yeah. pixels. Yeah. But they weren't wrong. They were not wrong. Um, S three has been, was bought by, um, Oh God, I can't remember who bought them. I want to say, I want to say Intel, I but I don't think that's night. right. I looked it up last night and I'm totally forgetting here. Let me just. Uh, Intel, obviously. Oh, oh, they're owned by HTC. HTC, that's right. Um, and in fact, the S3 name, I believe, is still in use. On mobile parts, probably. Um, I might be wrong about that, actually. Well, so Intel, after the i740 and the i752, which was the follow up, they did multiple other like they went through the whole Larrabee thing where they were going to revolutionize the graphics pipeline with a bunch of low low fi x86 cores. Right. Um, And then it just basically went disappeared. Uh, And rendition, you said, ended up at. uh, I've already forgotten. It's so hard to keep all the micron micron. Yeah, that's right. Yes. So, yeah, it was Um, it was a weird and like during this time there were so many everybody looked at what the market what the hardware was capable of and where the market was going and they decided different approaches to how to how to feed those markets so like you know rendition and intel were looking at the price of memory and were like well nobody's going to put lots and lots of memory on these cards ever so you know here, here we should we should just roll out these high inter- high speed interfaces to system memory and let everybody do everything out of system memory and nvidia and ati looked at what the cpus were capable of in terms of triangle setup and we're like we're going to hit a wall on this really fast so we need to get like some some computation on these processors so it's not just doing mitmapping mapping and trilinear filtering and thus the dawn of hardware transform and lighting then yeah that's when the gpu when nvidia launched the geforce 256 and yep. ati launched the radeon six months later it oh, was it was a, a transformative moment in, totally in that, i didn't know the oh sorry oh no no i mean in, in, the, in that like the computationally expensive part of playing games on these 3d accelerators suddenly moved off of the cpu and onto the gpu right like that that conceptually is the beginning of the modern era of the gpu right i think so Basically. yeah um i didn't realize the radeon was that close to the geforce in, in getting to market so i started at maximum pc this is easy for me to remember i started at maximum pc in june of 2000 and my first meeting with a vendor while a, a, as a maximum pc employee was a radeon meeting like huh. the second day i was there and wow. so they probably didn't roll it out for another three months at that point because they everybody brought us stuff super early so we could have timely coverage um but but it was that was a big deal huh in my mind i mean this is probably because i always bought nvidia products so that's just what i remember but like in my mind i don't remember the radeon name being out there until half-life 2 but that's obviously a marketing that's a like oh, that was way mar- later yeah they're marketing right they obviously were around way before that so so huh. so the thing about the thing about so one of the things that NVIDIA did that turned out to be really smart 
b- because of the thing that you just said is that they rolled out DDR memory was late coming. Yeah. So they just I, rolled out an got, SDR version of the GeForce yes. like six months before the DDR cards. I was still on a TNT one. Yeah. So I bought an SDR GeForce because I needed I was desperate to have it. Yeah. Because that was the the era of Quake 3 and I really needed Quake 3 to run better. Um, it, it turns out the DDR cards, since everything was fill rate limited, were almost twice as fast as the SDR yeah, cards. that was perhaps a hasty decision. I was always off cycle for whatever reason. I got a Voodoo 1. Okay. But then I, I tried to stretch my hardware as long as I could just for money reasons. Yeah, of course. So I skipped the Voodoo 2. Oof, that was a mistake. And I got a, T- and I got a TNT 1. Yeah. And then the TNT 2 came along. <laughs> it was dramatically better. Yeah. Uh, then I got a GeForce 256 SDR because I was due for a card and mm-hmm. then the DDR version came out and was massively better. And then the GeForce 2 was even better than that. Um, and I think I stayed on that. I'm trying to remember. I want to say I stayed on that GeForce 256 until the GeForce 4. Probably three or four would have been the next I skipped, smart yeah, upgrade. Yeah, I skipped. I skipped the GeForce 3 because I was that was when I started at GameSpot. So I was playing a ton of games on consoles. Uh-huh. That's, that was my that was my coverage beat. So I didn't get a I think I got like the low end GeForce four was my next card after that. Well, and I was going to say the weird. So that's when the GeForce four, I think, is when they started differentiating, like they started having multiple SKUs with yeah. very with that weren't just clocked down versions of the same chip. They were like versions of the chip that didn't bin or that parts were burned out on or something. Right. Uh, and like they had the GeForce MX, I think was the low end version of those cards. And then the TIs were the high ends and then the regular yes. ones were the, were the, just the GeForces. I had a, I believe I had a TI 4200. That was a fine car. Oh, right. They did numbers on those. I forgot. Yes. So. Which, which was the low end of there was, it was the TI 4200, 4400 and 4600. So. Well, so that was a weird time because the pipelines were still fixed function. So it wasn't like a general purpose compute pipeline. Like if they wanted to add new features, then they had to put silicon on for it or you had to do it on the cpu and it wasn't until the five series with the with the leaf blower the 5800 uh that 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 changed which was a few years later so yeah and that and that's when the general purpose compute pipeline happened on the gpu really that's when that started like they weren't feature complete for a few more years after that because they didn't have like they didn't have full if and x or you know all the different gates that you need yeah um but but it was pretty cool so that, that pretty much takes us into the modern era, both in terms of like the internal design of what a GPU is and also in the market dominance of the companies that made it yeah. through. But uh, the last thing I wanted to touch on real quick or just expand on um, was if you have a good sense of why 3D effects cratered so hard and so fast. Yeah, they never made a compelling 2D, 3D part. Is that all it was? I mean, they... they <laughs> It, it was first mover adva- disadvantage, right? So they they established the market and they set it up and then they didn't ever have a, like their products were always niche products in a market that needed to be mainstream and NVIDIA okay. and ATI had mainstream parts immediately. They couldn't, they couldn't go in commodity PCs because they were an extra part, <laughs> not a, not a, not a replacement part, right? Like they couldn't replace the desktop card. They had to be there in addition to a desktop. So card. it was, yeah. So instead of adding like four bucks to the cost of the thing for compact or, or Packard Bell or e-machines or whoever, it was another 150 bucks to the OEM and yeah. they weren't like, unless they could sell it into gamers it, it wasn't like like if you look at it from a from a if you're the purchaser for compact who's selling two million PCs a year or something and you're looking at ATI with the Rage Pro and NVIDIA with the TNT 2 and 3DFX with a TNT 2 plus a Voodoo 2 or Voodoo, you know, Voodoo Banshee, whatever Voodoo 3, their Voodoo 3 performance was never very good. Right. Like those cards, those cards couldn't compete with the TNT 2 and the Rage Pro. The Voodoo um, 3 was an all-in-one, to be clear. Hmm? Yeah, Voodoo everything after the Voodoo all-in-one. 2 was an all-in-one. Okay. So okay. The Banshee was just straight up bad, right? Banshee was straight up bad. The Voodoo Rush was really bad. The Banshee was was an okay 2D card that had kind of passable 3D on it. Um, the, the, the Voodoo 3 was fine. Like, it was not a bad card necessarily. It just wasn't. Like it wasn't as competitive with NVIDIA. And they, I think they, I feel like they also leaned on Glide longer than they should have, where NVIDIA was building robust Direct 3D and OpenGL drivers that were native. Uh, Voodoo was using the Glide wrapper for OpenGL for a long time. I think now that you mention it, I think that was another revelation of getting that TNT was that it just played a lot more games. 
like like I said, the Reva 128 was a real wake up call. I feel like at NVIDIA where they were like, oh, right. It doesn't matter how good our hardware is if the drivers suck. And yeah. and like and they the invested API in support is is lacking. Yeah. Yeah, they, they've spent a lot of time. I mean, if you look at the size of their DevRel org in NVIDIA versus other comparable companies then and, and even probably now, it's it's pretty astounding how how aggressively they spend money on that. Yeah. It makes a lot it of is, sense. That, that reputation persists to this day. Like you see it on message boards all the time. And in fact, like that's in the back of my mind, like NVIDIA is the one with the good drivers. Like that's a big part of the reason that I always bought their cards. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, it's it was it was. Like it, it, I thought we were going to talk about direct 3d and OpenGL this in this some, we kind of skip past this, but at that's, the same time, the part. undercurrent behind all of this was like, what's going to be the future of 3d rendering. Is it going to be yeah. this weird open consortium or is it going to be direct 3d? And it turns out that the open consortium never was able to move fast enough to support the new hardware. So like, People like vendors were always writing OpenGL extensions to support the new, like the hardware transform and lighting and the bump mapping and the normal maps and all that stuff. Uh, and and the, the just never landed on the OpenGL side. Like, yeah. it, made, I mean, it made supporting OpenGL really difficult. Right. And like that, that dynamic persists to this day, right? Like DX12 was robust and mature and on the market for ages before Vulkan really became a thing, right? Uh, it's... I don't, know, I don't know if those are as directly comparable I don't think it's in this direct, case. Yeah, it's, yeah, the Vulcan is complicated for whole other reasons. But yeah. um, the, I, 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 I came upon a Twitter thread of graphics programmers the other day kind of grousing about Vulcan in a way that I hadn't seen before. <laughs> that made me think maybe my understanding of Vulcan is not as uh, complete as it could be. It was it the one about the here's the number of lines of code it takes to draw a triangle in Vulcan? Some, something like that. Yeah. 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 Um, the other weird thing about Direct 3D like they iterated direct 3d so fast at that time period. Like they never released direct 3d. There was no direct 3d one direct 3d 2.0 launched in June of 1996 direct 3d 3.0 launched in September of that same year. Wow. So like four months, five months. Right. And like, I, I think the only direct 3d two game I ever remember playing was Tom Clancy's SSN that, that submarine, like the, the the underwater piloting game where you fl- flew the submarine like a plane um and they like they didn't really like microsoft was iterating that so quickly that they were releasing direct 3.3 3d 3.0 a 3.0 b 3.0 c month to month to month so you're always downloading these new things but but as a result by the time they got to 5 or 6 it i guess by the time they got to 5 because they skipped 4 it was robust and and yeah. like worked. I, re- I feel like I remember DirectX five lasting for a very long time. Five comparatively. Five was a five was for a while. Eight was when they added the programmable pipeline stuff. Yeah, those are the, like five, eight, eleven, and twelve are the big milestones in my memory. Yeah. So the other big hardware thing, the early hardware feature that made a huge impact on on like visual quality that we haven't talked about yet was the G the Matrox G four hundred, which was the post mystique. It was like their Rage Pro competitor, I guess, or Rage one twenty eight maybe competitor. Uh it, around the same time as the TNT. And it had bump map it had hardware bump mapping support. Oh. Huh. Which was which was really novel and literally no one used it. So because it was the only card that had it. Was it was the only card that had it. Yeah. But I mean, that that kind of thing came back around with the GeForce 3, right? Uh, was yeah. GeForce first, 3 was, was the first one that had bump mapping on the NVIDIA side, I think. The G400 yeah. might have been later when I think I might I might have reviewed that when I was at Maximum PC when okay. I think about it. I'd, it's I'd a have fun to time. Go, yeah, it's been a it's been a it's been a while. It was a big mess. Um, was, you know, it was it was easy to place the wrong bet back then because there were so many products on the market and everything was so immature. Well, and but not, on the, not, on not the other fully, hand, the cards not, were really cheap compared to today. Yeah, like the cards was, were 200 bucks at the high end. Yes, that's fair. Um, <laughs> things, things have gotten a little pricier now that you mentioned it. I, rem- I mean, 200 bucks was worth more then. But when fair. I went, yes. I remember going to Electronics Boutique to buy a Voodoo 2. I had pre-ordered. I was one of two people in Knoxville, Tennessee, who pre-ordered a Voodoo 2 from our, our electronics boutique. And I got a Creative Labs 3DFX Voodoo 2 card that the serial number was like 00000032. What? Yeah. Do you still have it? No, I, I got rid of it years oh, ago. I know. It might be worth something. I probably have a picture. It wasn't. I oh, looked. Oh, oh that, was, that was the last thing I wanted to mention before we probably wrap this thing up. But do you remember the weird 
almost, I hesitate to use the word cult, but there was like an insanely diehard fan base around 3D effects, like way longer than there should have been. Oh yeah. There were people, people clinging to their voodoos way after it was clear that the industry had moved on. Look, and it, like I, I had a voodoo two card in my machine well into the quake three era. Right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It was um, like, like if you Google, I should pull this up. Like if you Google images of the voodoo five, what an obscene thing that is. Oh, the Voodoo 5 was the one that was going to plug straight into the wall, right? Voodoo 5 6000, we had, like I said, we got an engineering sample and it had a power brick that was the size of like a gaming laptop power brick that you plugged into a, like a dipole port on the back of the card. Right. And then into the wall, right? Into the wall. Yeah. Like directly into the wall, did not run off the PC's power supply. No. And it um, was, it was an incredibly, it was like a workstation length card. It was really, right. really long. Like if you Google pictures of this thing, it looks photoshopped. It, it looks like somebody has copy pasted a video card on top of itself. Well, it had four of those like, I don't, I don't even know what those fans were called, but it was like a really specific size heatsink fan combo. And it had four of them on it, as I recall. Yeah, it's gigantic. Uh, this, it's got a handle on it. The other end of the card has a handle well, on it. So that was supposed to, so in the olden days, there were slots, like there was a slot that the screw went in and then the other end of the case for a full length. Uh, for a full length card, there was a, a, a slot that the other end would go in to support both sides of the card. And that's what that handle was. That's that's amazing. It was to make it reach. And the reason I bring it up is I just I have this memory and this may, this may have been like 100 people. I don't know. And not not that big a deal. But there was this weird boutique community of people trying to get their hands on like the Voodoo 5 samples that had gotten out into the wild. Oh, they and were like, highly desirable. Yeah. And they were trying there. It was like a user effort to maintain glide and bring it forward so they could keep playing games on 3D effects, even after that was no longer a going concern. They <laughs> really should have just they really should have just bought an NVIDIA or an ATI card. But they were just like desperately trying to keep 3D effects on life support. I wonder if somebody ever made like a DirectX or OpenGL to glide wrapper to go the other way. So you can play glide games on OpenGL cards or direct 3D cards. If there's anything I've learned about the internet is, is that if you have to ask, I wonder if ever, yeah, if ever someone did X, the answer is yes. It's, it's, um, it was a fascinating time because yeah, it was like, fun. stuff was happening constantly. Like you would, you would look at plan files for, like I said, like the people who are doing graphics programming at 3d realms and, and uh, id and Epic and, Epic, and yeah. places like that valve. And yeah. you would see all sorts of amazing stories come out as a result of that. Yeah. Um, things, things were just iterating way faster back then than they do now. We have a oh, couple shit. of friends of the pod who we are like X 3d FX folk that oh? are probably oh, far enough out of NDAs now that we might be able to get them on to talk. So I'll have to ask around. That would be fun. Um, but, but that, that time, like those, those guys, they were in Texas and they were, they built this thing. And I don't think, at the beginning, they didn't realize what they had. And then I think they had more. They thought they had more than they did yeah, real quickly. Well, you know, everything's bigger in Texas, right? Yeah, something like that. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was it was a it was a fun time to be an enthusiast. For um, sure. And I guess that's it for today. Yeah. We'll, we'll walk down memory lane. Yeah. Uh, I guess we've reached the point in the show where we talk about uh, the Patreon. Uh, if you on. if you would like to support uh, Brad and Will made a tech pod, you can by going to patreon.com slash tech pod for as little as two bucks a month. You will get access to the fabulous tech pod discord where you find out things like uh, how long uh, time is for a CPU versus human scale. And let's see what else we've talked about. Uh, we got a shout out uh, our our. Uh, uh, I idly asked a question in chat the other day, and then one of our fabulous users made an app, a web app that does that literally, thing. Literally coded a solution for us uh, to fulfill a very specific need that we had. I, I can't, I cannot express my gratitude enough. You know who you are. I think, I think we can out them, right? First time. Yeah. yeah. Um, made beep30.com. If you do a podcast and you need to sync it, we've tried it this oh, week. I'll let you know how it goes you, next week, I, I guess. I don't know if you want to bring that much load to that. I don't know how, how much capacity he's got to serve that page. Look, I, I'm, you, com you really, I'm comfortable. You want to out this thing? This is a burgeoning business. Yeah, I guess so. Um, I want to support support all of our uh, all of our fabulous patrons. Um, and yeah, like the, like there's just interesting conversations basically every day in there. It's a yeah. fabulous place to hang out. 
Uh, I have enjoyed having human contact <laughs> um, yeah. during these dark times. Helps. And sure. uh, yeah, it's a it's a it's a lovely spot. Yes. Uh, and as always, we thank all of our, our patrons for for more. If you if you spend five bucks a month, you get access to the monthly exclu- patron exclusive episode where we usually talk about projects. Yeah. Yeah. I moved everything over to Home Assistant last week because smart things I goes also, away today. I, I am following, let's say, uh, four to six weeks behind in your footsteps. Uh-huh. How's it going? I also I also just let's say I spent a lot of last weekend messing with Home Assistant on on my nas it's really neat and and then well no not on the nas it's not oh no the nas is a pain in the ass i just bought a raspberry pi because it was way easier not not in freebsd so yes i too just bought a raspberry pi (laughs) Four to do things like that on because it's not gonna happen in bsd but we got this pi 4 here what do you what do you well we should save this this episode's long already yeah We'll talk about it. Uh, at the end of the debating month. whether to put Raspbian or Ubuntu on that thing. I did Raspbian. Raspbian's okay. easier to maintain. Yeah, that's fair. Um, uh, as always, thank you to all of our patrons, uh, but especially our executive producer level patrons, Jacob Chapel, Andrew Cotton, and David Allen. Uh, without all of your all support, we wouldn't still be making the podcast. So thank you yeah. all so much. We would just be having these conversations in Discord, and it would be just <laughs> for us, and you that's know, right. be completely wasted. So. Um, yes. We, we appreciate you all a bunch. And uh, and thanks to Julian uh, for doing transcripts every week for the show. Yes. Yeah, that stuff's awesome. Uh, if you have friends who are deaf or hard of hearing and you think that they would be interested in the show, you can share it with them. The transcripts are available at techpod.content.countdown. There's a big transcripts button there. And we have them for like the last eight, five or six episodes, seven episodes now, I think. So uh, that is awesome. And if you like them, please let us know so we so we keep doing them because like if nobody uses them, we're probably going to not, you know. But if people, if, if, if anybody's finding them useful, we would like to know. Yeah. For sure. um, and I guess that's it for us. Yeah. We'll, we'll uh, fire, see, up, fire up some GL Quake. I kind of want to. Yeah. Can we can we play some GL Quake? Is, is, the, is the master server still up? I don't know. I don't think I think we can just look. I know your IP. You know my IP. We can put our IPs together. And that's true. And the question is, who gets the ping advantage? I don't know. Mm. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to host. That's all I'm saying. Have to, we'll have to shoot for it. OK. OK. Uh, See you all next week. Thanks for listening, everybody. Bye. Have a good one.